Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. In the second week of Advent, I don't know how many of you follow the traditions of Advent, but there's usually four candles uh, that you light during the Advent season. And the first is the prophet's candle, which uh, represents hope. And we talked about hope last week. The second candle that you light beginning today, the second Sunday of Advent, is the candle of faith. And it's also called Bethlehem's candle. And so I want to talk to you this morning about faith and what faith has to do with this city of Bethlehem. And so let's just begin uh, at a good place to begin by reminding ourselves of what faith is and turning to the scriptures to find a description of what faith is. Here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Would you read that out loud with me? We'll read it once again. Read it with me. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That word assurance is a really interesting word because it literally means to stand under, hypostasis in the Greek. Faith is the assurance. Faith stands under what we hope for, and is the conviction of things not seen. Conviction is a word, again, in the original language that means the convincing evidence that makes someone fully agree and understand and realize the truth or validity of something. So here's how faith operates, just to start. Here's what it means. Faith stands under our hope and holds it up. We, we talked last week about the power and the importance of hope, and yet I think we all know the reality of losing hope at times. And so faith, the scripture tells us, stands under our hope and holds it up, and a hope that holds up becomes the proof of eternal things. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying here in Hebrews 11, verse one. Again, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Faith stands under assurance, our hope, and holds it up. And a hope that holds up becomes the convincing evidence of things not seen. That's an incredible thought to me. Because in the midst of a world that often loses hope, in the midst of people who in difficult and dark times can easily lose hope, people of faith, Christians, have something underneath our hope that holds it up. And when the world looks at a hope that holds up, they become convinced of unseen things of a God who is real and alive that we cannot see. This is how faith operates. Well, where does faith come from? Where does this faith that stands under our hope and holds it up, even in the darkest and most difficult times, where does this kind of faith or foundation come from? Well, we're told in Scripture, I'm so glad you asked. Romans 10, <laughs> verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. I love this because faith is never something that as Christians we conjure up. See, the world knows about the power of hope. And the world knows about the power of faith, right? We sing about stuff like this. You got to have faith. We know that faith is, is powerful, but where does it come from? You would almost think when you hear the world talk about the power of faith that it's something that you kind of muster up. Like if you just strain hard enough, faith will pop out somewhere. Like, faith, right? But that's not so in Scripture. 
In fact, Paul says in the book of Ephesians that this kind of faith that stands under our hope and holds it up even in the darkest and most difficult times is a gift. We're saved by grace through faith, and that is a gift. It's not of works. It's not by straining or striving. This faith is a gift. It comes from hearing. What we hear from God then is a gift that creates faith through hearing. And this faith stands under our hope and holds us up. What a beautiful picture of the gift that God has given us. Well, why is faith so important then? Faith is important because it connects us to things that we cannot see. Faith connects us to things that we cannot see. Let me ask you this. How do you know what you know? There's a lot of talk about how we know what we know and what we can be certain about. And in our day, <clears throat> people want to reduce everything down to what you can know through science, which means it's what you can observe. It's what you can see. And certainly there are many things that we thank God we can come to know through observation. But is that all we're limited to? Are we only able to ever know what we see? Or are there things that we know through other means? And for the person of faith, this is why faith is such a gift, because we come to know things beyond things that are deeper than what we see. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, so we do not lose heart. That reminds me of hope. That reminds me of a faith that stands under and holds up our hope in the difficult times. We do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. That's something to praise God for, isn't it? That the older we get, the more our outer self is wasting away. <laughs> our inner self, the inner man, our soul, our spirit is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Isn't that good news? As we look, watch this, as we look, not to things that are seen. It's a paradox, isn't it? Not a contradiction, a paradox. How do you look at things that are not seen? As we look to things that are not seen, to, but the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. This is why faith is so important because faith connects us to things that we cannot see. Faith connects us and allows us to see things that are eternal because the things that we see are transient. The things that, are e that we don't see are eternal. Faith is so powerful because when we search and we look for things that we can see, but everything that we see is temporary, how thankful are we this morning that we have faith connecting us to unseen, eternal things, and therefore we don't lose heart, even in our affliction, even when we put our hope in the things that we see and they start to fall apart, the Bible says that as people of faith, we don't lose heart. Even when our own bodies are falling apart, we don't lose heart. Because our faith has connected us to things that we don't see that are eternal. So let me summarize. Faith comes not from seeing, but from hearing. And so the words and the plans and the purposes and the promises of God 
form a foundation that holds up our hope in every season, in every generation, for eternity. This is what our faith does for us. And this hope that faith holds up cannot be shaken, even in the darkest of times. And here's the picture, church. I believe that God wants for us as people of faith to have the kind of hope that cannot be shaken, that the world would look at and say, how can you still have hope? Where does your hope come from? See, while the whole rest of the world is growing cynical, so much of the tone of our day is just pure and unhidden cynicism, hopelessness. And the world looks at us and sometimes laugh and sometimes mocks, oh, you Christians, you're so naive. You're still hopeful. <laughs> Not in temporary things, in eternal things. And see, this hope, back to Hebrews 1, remember? The convincing evidence of things that are not seen. Where does your hope come from? People whose hope holds up in the darkest of times become convincing evidence to the unbeliever that God is real. Because we say it's God who is holding us up. It's God and our trust in him, our faith that stands under our hope and holds it up. People of hope. That's who we're supposed to be, people of faith. Well, you should be saying by now, what, what does this have to do with Bethlehem? Why is the Bethlehem candle the faith candle? I'm so glad you asked, that's a great question. So I want you to try, I'm going to give you a little extra time to find the book of Micah. <laughs> Go left from Hebrews and find the book of Micah because the story of the city of Bethlehem illustrates the principles that I've just been telling you. And I want to look at this story through the lens of three people in particular who had their experience with and in this city of Bethlehem, whose hope held up in the darkest times and was held up by their faith in what God had spoken to them. Micah chapter 5, just a word of background here, Micah comes as a prophet in days of great darkness and difficulty for God's people. He was a contemporary of Isaiah the prophet as well. He was on the scene at the same time. And he was speaking words from God to stand under and hold up the hope of God's people because the hope of God's people was collapsing in this day. Why was it collapsing? They were witnessing the fall and the conquering of the northern kingdom of Israel. Perhaps you remember in Israel's history that after David and after Solomon with Solomon's two sons, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the nation split and was divided. And you have this successive history of the kings of northern Israel and the kings of southern Israel and Judah. And you have this chronology of these kings, many of whom turned away from God. And so the history of Israel is sort of this downward spiral from its glory days in the reign of David into darkness. And near the end of the time of the kings, God was sending his prophets with the message of warning. And the warning essentially was this, don't put your hope in the kingdoms of men. This is all falling apart. This is all coming crashing down. 
But even in these dark times, put your hope in God. They were witnessing the fall of the northern kingdom and predicting the fall of Judah. And here's what Micah says, Micah 5 verse 1. Now, muster your troops, O daughter of troops, for siege is laid against us. And with a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem, Epathra, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. And then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand And shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. So in this time of darkness comes forth through the prophet the word of God. What is he saying? He's saying that a ruler from ancient of days would come to shepherd Israel in the strength of the Lord and that this ruler would come from the city of Bethlehem. Now what's significant about Bethlehem prior to this that the people of Israel would know is that David, their great king, came from Bethlehem. You remember when Samuel, the prophet, went in search to anoint the king that would succeed Saul, for Saul had turned his back once more in disobedience to the word of the Lord. And so the Lord sends Samuel, the prophet, to anoint a new king, and Samuel goes to Bethlehem. He goes to the house of Jesse, Jesse having his sons to stand before the prophet, and one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, God essentially says, nope, 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 until there's no more sons, and Samuel says, do you have any other sons? And Jesse's like, oh yeah, I do. There's one more, I forgot about him. He's out in the field with the sheep. So they call David in, and as many of you know the story, he's the anointed future king of Israel, the youngest forgotten son, the shepherd in the field. So Bethlehem had significance because it was where David was from, but that's not Micah's point in this prophecy. Micah is not saying Bethlehem is chosen because it's the great city of David where David was from. What's Micah saying? Bethlehem is so small and so insignificant, it's barely worth noticing. In fact, when the enemies of Israel come and the call goes out to muster the troops, it's as if Micah's saying, hey, Bethlehem, don't even bother. You're so small, we don't even need you. And God's word is that not from Jerusalem, not from the capital, not from one of the great fortified cities, but from this nothing place, this nowhere town, this forgotten place, Bethlehem, God would call this one who would come to save and bring peace to Israel. That's Micah's message. And isn't it interesting, verse three, that Micah says, when she who is in labor has given birth. He points to the signs of the coming of Christ. In the darkest of times, a word to hear, to believe, to hold up the hopes of God's people. Well, fast forward 700 plus years and turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 1. 700 plus years later, the angel of the Lord, a herald, Micah was the herald in those dark days, but now equally dark and oppressive times. The people of Israel are once more living in captivity, though they're in their land, the Romans rule over them. They are not free in the place that God has given them. And so these are dark times, times of waiting. 
Lord, when will you come? When will you fulfill your promise? Most of you know that between the time of the prophets and the time of the gospels, when Jesus is revealed, there's a 400 plus year period of darkness, no word from God, no miraculous sign. And the people of God are losing hope. Lord, when will you come and when will you fulfill what you've promised to do? And the angel this time, not a prophet, but the angel Gabriel appears to a a woman, a young, unknown, unimportant in the world's eyes, a woman named Mary who lived in Nazareth. We're told that she was a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph. And that the angel came to her and greeted her and told her that she would conceive. And Mary, of course, is very troubled about this. How is this going to happen? Since I'm a virgin and the angel says the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And that nothing is impossible with God. And I love it because Mary says, do you remember what she says? Luke chapter one and verse 37, after the angel says, nothing is impossible with God, in verse 38, Mary says, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your what? Word. Here is a word from God to hold up my hopes. Let it be to me according to your word. Now that may sound very romantic. It sounds kind of poetic. Let it be to me according to your word. And we might think, you know, that's a good thing to say. I think I'll say, Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Be careful. Because though it sounds beautiful and poetic and it is a beautiful and powerful expression of faith, do you know what it meant for Mary to say, let it be to me according to your word. It meant that she would have to be born to a people who were oppressed and enslaved because Messiah would come through Israel. And God had promised this, so for it to be according to his word, Mary would suffer in this way. It would mean that she would suffer the suspicions to her reputation and to her family's name. Oh, really? A virgin conceiving? Sure. But this is what the prophets said would happen. So for Mary to say, let it be unto me according to your word, would mean that she would not only have to suffer that suspicion, but that she would have to travel a very inconvenient and uncomfortable distance to an insignificant place because Micah said that this one would be born in Bethlehem, would come from Bethlehem. Mary would have to make the 80-mile journey on a donkey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Pregnant. Oh Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Do you mean that? Pack your bags. (laughs) You're going on a trip. It would mean bearing the pain of childbirth away from her home and her family. See, for Mary, only in faith, would she make this journey and suffer and go through all of these difficulties because only faith could hold up her hope that this was what God was doing and that it was good. But the plot thickens because in faith, Mary and Joseph go and Then we're told in Matthew chapter 2, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Would you turn here with me and look at this? It'll be on the screen too. Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus was born in where? Bethlehem. The very place that Micah said the king from ancient days who would become a shepherd to God's people, would be born. In Bethlehem, 
of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem was troubled with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Catch this story. Wise men, we'll call them magi for our third M, Micah, Mary, and the magi. Come from the east. Where is the king of the Jews to be born? Herod's troubled. He's the political king, sort of, of the Jews in his day. And so he thinks now one is being described as the successor and a threat to his own power. So he's troubled. Jerusalem's troubled and stirred up. He inquires, where is the king going to be born of the religious leaders and scribes? And they, of course, unroll the scroll of what? Micah, 730 plus years earlier, they unroll the scroll and they say, we know exactly where the king is going to be born, Herod. And so they told him, verse 5, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet Micah, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. This is so fascinating to me. Because the star led the Magi to Jerusalem. Right? They saw a star in the east. But the scriptures led them to Jesus. Where will this king be born? How can we see him who has never been seen before. Oh, the word of God will speak forth. In Bethlehem, he is to be born, this one who will shepherd the people of God. And so the wise men come and they worship. Now, this isn't necessarily the point I want to make, but I, I want to just notice with you, isn't it amazing there's no record of the religious leaders going and seeing. They were six kilometers away in Jerusalem. You can see Bethlehem from Jerusalem. And the question comes up, where, where is the king? Oh, we know exactly, he's over in Bethlehem. They didn't even go. They didn't even go to see. which I think speaks to people like you and me at Christmas and times like these that we can become so familiar with the story that we lose our wonder and stop responding in faith to God who is working still in our day, unfolding this glorious plan Church, don't let that happen this Christmas. That's what Advent is all about, waiting, wondering, allowing God to restore and rebuild and refresh in us that sense of anticipation. Yes, Lord, you have a great plan. Yes, Lord, you have made great promises to us. And Lord, we, we want to respond in faith to be the people of hope whose hopes hold up even in the darkest and most difficult times so that the world can see that you are real. That's what we want our story to be, right? Like Micah who prophesied in the darkest of days, like Mary, who went through, because of faith, all of these difficult things, believing. Like the Magi, who, who traveled this great distance, believing. Lord, we want our faith to bring from us a response 
Not just to be like the religious leaders. Oh yeah, we know that story. It's in Micah 5, 1 through 5. And see, this is the thing about Advent. And I think that some people get this wrong. Some people think Advent is about reenacting Jesus' original coming. I was actually with some people earlier this week and they were saying, oh, we can't sing joy to the world yet because we're in Advent. And we're pretending like Jesus hasn't come yet, so it's still really dark and no one knows. And, and some people celebrate Advent that way. That, that's fine. But I think, I think what I want to say, church, is we're not, we're not pretending. We're not reenacting. We're carrying the story that has unfolded already so much more. We have the responsibility in our day of heralding this hope that Jesus has already come. And this is how we know that the promises that he's made to us that have yet to be fulfilled can be trusted because as we talked about last week, he has already made the greatest down payment. He has made this incredible investment so that we know he's not gonna back out of the deal. Yeah, all right. That scared me, but all right. (laughs) It's true. Let God be praised. So what does this mean for us? Well, first off, it means that the word became flesh. That's what we're celebrating. See, when we say that faith comes by hearing, this faith that holds up our hope, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, we have this incredible blessing and advantage, church, that The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what Christmas is about. And when we say that the word became flesh, we don't mean that Jesus, you know, just sort of dipped his toe in this world and said, yep, I was with you. He didn't just barely get his feet wet, but what did Jesus do? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He plunged himself all the way in. Born in a nothing town like Bethlehem in a stable where there was no room for him in the inn. Suffering in the midst of a people who were oppressed. Dying on a cross, bearing the weight of our sin. Jesus entered, listen, all the way in to death. And the Bible says now for us that we have a great high priest who sympathizes with us, who is tempted in all ways like we have been and are, and yet was without sin. The word became Flesh, and I love this, in the city of David in Bethlehem, David, where the shepherd became king, in the city of David, one was born, our great king from the ancient days became a shepherd to gather the people of God who were scattered by sin and death to eternal life. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The one who would come to lay down his life for the sheep. That's what this means. He can be trusted. The word became flesh to dwell among us so that we celebrate this morning, Emmanuel, God with us. But it also means your waiting, my waiting is not wasted. Advent is a time where we wait. We remember that we're waiting for his second coming. Having so much more of the story to stand under our hope of what God has done. But our waiting, dear brothers and sisters, is not wasted because we know that God is working. We don't have to worry in our waiting 
because God is working. Is there something that you're waiting for? Wanting the Lord to do? You know, when we were singing, you are good, you are good, and your love endures. I was thinking of all the people here this morning who are asking God to do a good thing, maybe where there's heartbreak or difficulty or struggle or pain in our lives, and we're saying, God, would you come and do something good in this difficult thing? And we're waiting, we're we're wondering, God, where is your goodness? Listen, your waiting is not wasted. Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. And he will not forget you. He has not forgotten you. Listen, church, God blesses little towns like Bethlehem and forgotten sons like David and humble women that no one knows, like Mary. God blesses those who are waiting. Let your faith in his promise hold up your hope. And finally, as I was thinking about faith this week and Looking into what God's word says about faith, I was struck in the gospels how many times Jesus would heal someone and he would say to them, your faith has made you whole. And I was thinking about all the people that would be here today who need God's healing in one way or the other. Healing for our families. Healing for our bodies. Healing for our broken hearts. Oh, church, hear the word of the Lord and believe your faith will make you whole. That doesn't mean that the trials and troubles that you're experiencing are because you don't have enough faith. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that in what you lack, faith is a gift that fills up what is missing while we're waiting anymore. Your faith will make you whole. And so today I want to herald the message of faith to you, church, as a gift to build your lives upon that we might be people of unshakable hope that the world might look at us and be convinced of the goodness of our God. Amen. Father.